Okay, so, so welcome to the um, LNG panel. On the panel today we have uh, Jon Skule Storeil, CEO of Ilko LNG, Øystein Kalleklev, CEO of Flex LNG. And we have uh, Andy uh, Orkar from CEO Gaslog Partners, and we have uh, Antoine Lafarge from CFO uh, Tellurian. Uh, it's been five years. It's been five years since rates uh, last time were above $100,000 a day, uh, and rates have been below cash break even for more than four years. Rates are up uh, five, six times in the course of six months, and uh, we argue LNG is clearly the hottest uh, shipping segment uh, these days, so looking forward to a good, uh, good discussion. Uh, Um, they actually, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. They have not put the most updated slide pack uh, on the stage, but that's... Uh, uh, rates are higher now. Huh? <laughs> rates are higher. <laughs> rates are higher. <laughs> okay, so, so we skip that. Uh, rates have now surpassed uh, $100,000 uh, a day, and high season has, has just started. Uh, October is usually, in terms of seasonality, on par with the yearly average, if you at least look at past uh, seven years seasonality, and uh, now we're at six-digit rates, and, and the high season has just started, as I mentioned. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, demand drivers, supply of ships, etc., but uh, how can a picture uh, turn so rapidly from uh, rates at 20,000 in the second quarter and now above, way above 100 uh, in Q4? We're going to have an open discussion. No, I, you know, target, it's so. basically fundamentals. You know, uh, you, you, you had this slump, which has lasted for four or five years, but d driven primarily of two factors. One is the lay of all the Australian trains. They are all coming on stream now. And then you had, of course, a lot of optimism after Fukushima, maybe not in Japan, but uh, for ship owners. And, uh, of course, they order a lot of vessels. These vessels hit the market. Then you had delays. But now, you know, People have been losing money for a lot, long time, and you know this has affected the, uh, the amount of new buildings. And suddenly, you know, when you have 10% growth every year in the in, in the LNG space, you know, back in 2000 you had 100 million tons. Then you doubled it to 2010 to 200 million tons. 2020 you double again to 400 million tons. You probably be at 600 million tons by 2030. So you have this huge trend growth, which is helping the the shipping segment because when you have this trend line growth, you don't really have to go through a big scrapping cycle to rebalance the market. You only have to wait for the trend growth to catch up. And when you also then in addition have the fact that people haven't been ordering a lot of vessels lately, then you know surprise surprise the market will be tight and people will be making money again. That sums it up very nicely. <laughs> I, I think what's important to note is, is this year we uh, we have had a, a summer market in the LNG uh, LNG side, which has is basically the first time in in five years that we've seen a, a spike in the, in the rates in summer time. And, and of course, it's not uh, it's not unusual or unnatural. It's uh, it's just a sorry, it's just a. Uh, Factor that uh, shipping is getting tight, and uh, when there's uh, in the I mean, there's always been more activity for the summer because you use LNG uh, gas to produce um, produce uh, energy or electricity, and of course, electricity consumption goes up uh, during the summer. But over the last four years, there's been too many ships around, so we haven't actually seen a, rate, a spike in rates, whereas we have seen a spike in, in activity. This year, uh, shipping market was a bit more tight, and of course, we saw a spike in, in rates. Now, everyone expected it to come down again over the summer, which it didn't really do. It was a bit more quiet uh, after the summer, but, uh, well, as you say, we're back into six digits, uh, looking quite interesting towards the winter. And um, uh, this is in a year of 2018 where we have all-time high deliveries. So it's quite remarkable. Next year, deliveries are coming off uh, big time, and, and uh, yeah, I guess uh, both Aistana and myself are looking forward to the next few years. N not everybody expected the, the market to slip after the summer, because I was in a panel with you in March, and Nikolai Divik was asking me the same question. So what do you th how do you think the market will develop in 2018? I said, I, it will cool down after the winter season. It will start picking up for the summer, and this, uh, this year it's just going to keep climbing, because people will see that the market will 
will be very tight for 2018-19. So they want to, you know, get access to tonnage, and that's what happened. You know, you didn't have a shoulder mount. It's just kept on going because everybody seeing that, you know, suddenly you have had the luxury of tapping into the spot market for easy access to cheap vessels for a long time, and now you are getting afraid of actually getting a vessel to to lift your cargo. Maybe I'll add a point to this, which is. It's interesting to see how, on the LNG side, the uh, market was expected to be tight. I'm uh, oh, sorry, was not expected to be tight. It was expected to have 30 million tons of additional capacity for this year. And we were wondering, how is this volume going to be absorbed by the market? And guess what? It's a commodity business. So supply and demand find a way to find an equilibrium. And actually, all this supply has been absorbed by the market yet again. And we expect that it's going to continue next year as well. And then we have high prices. So in, in the end, what we really have is a tight market for this year, and we've got another 30 million tons coming to the market for 2019, another 30 million tons coming for 2020, and then uh, we expect that there's going to be a very a period of pretty high prices in the LNG industry in general. <coughs> we, um, if, uh, we argue that U.S. exports is like the main catalyst uh, of, uh, of uh, the reshaping of, of rates, uh, there were zero volumes out of the US in 2015, and uh, this year we forecast in the mid 20s, and by 2021, about 70 million, million tons. Uh, and uh, the distance uh, the US exports are, are heading is about twice the, the, the average. Could, could one compare the, the LNG cycle? Uh, finally, there's the slides I wanted to have. Uh, here you see, uh, uh, on the chart to the left, you see U.S. Uh, exports. This is our forecast. So by 2018, you have 22 million tons, and by 2021, you have uh, about 70 million tons, and you see our forecast of average sailing distance to the right. Uh, could, um, uh, <coughs> if, you, if, if I ask you, Tullerian, uh, first, uh, uh, how, how would this picture look uh, from the U.S. side uh, in 2023 and 2025? So, look, I, I think uh, it's a shipping conference, so obviously it matters to talk about the distances, but when we are on the liquefaction side of the equation here, um, we are talking to our customers, and the question to our customers is, what is the all-in price of the LNG, right? So you need to take into account a number of items that includes, okay, what's the cost of sourcing the gas? What's the cost of uh, liquefying the gas? What technology do you use? Access to labor, all this cost overruns. Uh, cost of financing, having the depths of the US market to finance projects. Um, and then eventually you have the uh, shipping cost, right? So when we uh, see uh, new projects being developed, whether it's um, uh, Congratulations to Shell and the LNG Canada project in general. Uh, we talk about Arctic LNG too. Uh, how do you get around the Northern Sea route to go back to Asia? You also have to factor in all the rest. So I've mentioned the four key items, but maybe you think about taxes and uh, potential subsidies. And uh, when you factor all this in, the question from the uh, customer itself is, what is the cost of my LNG delivered to each Shanghai or Tokyo Bay or one of these places? Um, so, at the end of that um, analysis, uh, we firmly believe that uh, LNG coming out of the Gulf Coast is going to be very competitive on a global basis. And that's because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the LNG, the, the world in general uh, on the energy side uh, wants more LNG, and the U.S. is uh, incredibly, incredibly well positioned to satisfy this need. Uh, there's a lot of gas uh, coming out of Shell. Uh, we've got incredible technology and ability to develop projects. Uh, we are at uh, Tellurian, we're developing driftwood, and we're using an uh, EPC contract with Bechtel. So we feel highly comfortable we can uh, develop the project on time and on budget. And then when you look at uh, the cost of sending the LNG to, uh, say, Japan, uh, with about 100,000 day rate, you had two bucks an M uh, back and forth, uh, return included. Um, and then sometime when the LNG rates are closer to uh, 70,000 bucks an M, uh, we're closer to 150 to 175 or so. So all this taken into account, that makes the LNG coming out of the US uh, very competitive on a global basis. And we think that um, you're going to get a lot of that uh, shipping activity coming out of the US, yes. <coughs> if one... Um if one look in 2014-15, in, uh, uh, 
then the LPG shipping companies managed to capture the ARB uh, between the US price and the Asian price. Uh, and if you compare now with the LNG, there's a $3 margin uh, on the table, and, and rates are in excess of $100,000 a day. Who will, who will capture that ARB? Could, could rates double from here? Uh, we're all, we just started. We're uh, probably a few months into a multi-year uh, LNG cycle. So who will, who will capture this margin? Well, I think uh, the big difference between uh, LPG uh, transportation and LNG is, of course, that the, our clients control a much bigger share of the fleet uh, on LNG. But of course, uh, the, the few uh, ships that are actually uh, trading in the spot market should be able to capture um, as much well, as there is when uh, and if the market is tight enough. And I think um, it's just up to us uh, uh, ship owners to, uh, to uh, well, we can say uh, act responsibly, but don't over order. And uh, let's just uh, try to keep this, um, uh, this advantage we have for as long as, as possible. And of course, uh, LNG ships takes uh, three years to build, so we know what the uh, supply is going to be over the next three years. Uh, what happens after that, of course, is another matter. But uh, we see already now that our, our clients are, are looking for longer-term charters. They're looking for uh, both uh, prompt delivery but also forward delivery, and I can't blame them. Uh, Nikolai, I would just add there's been a generally supportive backdrop with the oil price and, and where JKM has been. Uh, perhaps JKM is feels like it should be a little higher now than, than it actually is at $85 Brent. But with that backdrop and the general opportunity for our customers to make money in that, uh, in that commodity price environment, clearly there is a lot of room for, for shipping rates to increase. Uh, but I think it'll generally mirror the, the uh, appreciation we can see in the cargo market uh, for, for further upside from some of the levels you just mentioned. Hey Stan, would you like to add on this? Sorry. Of course, I think, you know, I, when you go and meet charters today, they say oh, $115,000 a day, it's quite expensive. So let's talk uh, one year. So then I say, okay, you can get it for 114000 then. <laughs> so uh, because the market will be very tight, why will want you want to give that away? You know, we've been suffering the LNG ship owners for several years now. So then the next question is, okay, what about three years? But as uh, Jonas mentioned, there is three year lead time more or less on a ship. So why, you know, the market's going to be tighter for a long time, so why don't we want to give away a lot of discount on going three years? So then they ask, okay, what about five or seven years? So that's the good thing when you have a good and tight shipping market, is you're adding period to the market. And that's also what's happening in the, in the physical market. 2017, you had uh, long-term fixtures, three to five years, they were up uh, from 25 to 50. Year on day, they are up 60%. So. You know, once, once the, the market gets tight, you know, the tables are turning and people are also less, uh, more getting more concerned about uh, getting access to cargo so that they can fulfill their lifting obligations. So, so I think rates have, uh, have a way to go here, absolutely. But what, do you, what do they respond when you say that, uh, would you like one year at 140? No. <laughs> that, so we're not, not there so yet. We're not here uh, at 140, no, no <laughs> not yet. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Okay, th this is, uh, this is uh, taken from our research. Uh, on the slide to the left, you see the average sailing distance in, in, uh, in uh, LNG uh, shipping, and it peaked in 2012 with the uh, Middle East exports, and then you had a uh, lot of US now Australian liquefaction plants coming on stream, which led to a decline in the average sailing distance. And then with US volumes, you saw then uh, sailing distances increase again. Um, how should we think about, if you look on the chart to the right, you see that the distance of US uh, volumes, these are actual 17, is, is twice Australia and 1.85 times the average of the market. How should we think about uh, the distances of, of US volumes when you also move into uh, uh, tariffs? Uh, uh, just a brief, brief slide on this. Uh, if you look in, in 2017, 11% uh, of US LNG was exported to China, but it was only 3% of, of Chinese uh, imports. Uh, on the chart at the bottom left, uh, this has increased to 6% by H1 uh, 2018. So how should we think about uh, the sailing distance going forward and, and the risk of tariffs? 
the end market is Far East, so basically what's happening now is, you know, China, they contracted all together in total 1.2 million volumes from uh, from US, from Corpus Christi with Chenier, and, and then of course they have three portfolio contracts with Total, BP, and Shell, where they can source this for, from wherever they want to, including US, but uh, right now they're just going to shift, uh, shift around on the cargo, so they have a cargo from Australia to Japan, that cargo will hit uh, China, and uh, the American uh, volume then will hit uh, Japan. So you can easily swap around that on, on short-term basis and could actually be good for ton mileage, but uh, it's it's more a problem in relation to uh, getting FIDs on your uh, liquefaction plant in, in the US. And of course the main beneficiaries of this uh, policy is uh, Russia, Qatar, Canada, you know, where they can easily get uh, better you know, off-take agreements and, uh, you know, Qatar increased their capacity not from 77 to 100, which they plan to do, but 110, you know, Novatex, Arctic LNG, that 20 million ton that might uh, very well hit the market now. So, so uh, you know, the, there is demand for gas and, if, uh, and it, it makes it a bit more difficult for Antoine, but, you know, he has a very good project. Uh, three dollars FOB US, so it just uh, illustrates how cheap gas is, you know. Burn value of gas is 17% of Brent, that's 14 dollars, and if you can ship it for three three dollars FOB, it's much better to, you know, use natural gas than, than crude oil, and definitely, you know, coal, uh, more from a po pollution point of view. Yeah, I feel compelled to respond. <laughs> 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 we actually feel comfortable with the situation, but that's probably because of our business model, which is a bit different than the usual way of developing liquefaction capacity. But um, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, uh, of course, if you have a normal balance sheet, it's more like 550, you know, but still it's very cheap with that kind of gas. That is true. Look, the point that you made about uh, the fact that we can swap cargoes around, that's very fundamental. That's also, look, the vice chairman of Tellurian is uh, Martin Houston, who was one of the uh, uh, key people to push for desti destination flexibility. And I think that's what you see in the market today, but I guess what I'm, the main point that I'm trying to make here is that this is now a global commodity, right? And then up until very recently, the past year or two, I would say that the LNG was still very much on a bilateral sort of approach between a, uh, uh, somebody who supplies it and sub someone who's the end consumer. Uh, now you can swap the cargoes around, and if you look at 2017, 30% of the LNG business was traded on a spot basis defined as less than four years. So when you have the, uh, the spot business, then that means that uh, from our standpoint, when we think about uh, the tariff uh, potential issues, um, then we're saying, look, this, we need to bifurcate this into two things. There's do you need the Chinese investors to support and effectively underwrite your project financially speaking or through co contracts? And the second part is, um, uh, is that going to have an impact on the overall LNG demand? So for us, we ran a process, went around the world and asked a number of um, potential customers slash investors whether they wanted to invest in our project. We run this process. We feel very comfortable and confident where we stand today. Uh, we expect a number of announcements uh, soon um, and be in a position to call FID um, by the, in the first half of next year. Uh, so we do not depend on Chinese investors uh, to come and invest in our project. Uh, However, I think it's fundamental to see that the growth in the LNG industry comes uh, in, in a big part of it comes from China. So China grew 45% or so last year. Uh, it's on track to grow another 45% this year. It will therefore become the second largest uh, consumer of gas uh, in the market at somewhere between 55 and 60 million tons. And then so long as they, uh, China, uh, continues to consume the product and wants to have more gas inside the energy mix, then this will translate in, um, you know, the strong demand, strong need for additional shipping, uh, and strong need for new FID and liquefaction projects. So, so tariffs is, is less, less of a worry then? To, to sum up. I had the lunch with Antoine and Mr. Fang from Bukom and I told them, you know, they should just send, you know, Congress should give authority to Henry Kissinger to go to China. He could have Hank Paulson to be, have his briefcase and hammer out a deal and then have a yes-no vote in Congress and, you know, that would solve itself. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
uh, if we could have the slides back up again. Uh, this shows uh, our forecast of ton mile to the left, 18% uh, in 19 and 12% in 2020, so that's 30% uh, in two years. Uh, and on the chart to the right, we have uh, supply growth, which will be 50% lower in 19 over 18. Uh, and if you sum the 19 and 20 supply growth, it will be 15% or half uh, demand. So when you look at the rates today... So you're, actu you're actually saying that uh, volumes are going up, ton miles is going up, and ships deliveries are going down? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. The what, what, was it too, too, too complicated, no, the way I, I said it? I, I, no, this is why he didn't order any vessels. <laughs> he never got them at. <laughs> so, so in brief, ton mile, two years, 30% supply of ships, uh, 15. Uh, uh, gas long during, during the, the last uh, peak, uh, you kept on chartering out ships on historical averages, uh, uh, which saved you during the downturn. Uh, but you seek to benefit a bit more from the upturn this time when you look at this picture, if we if we write. Sure. Well, we, we do have two public companies. One, uh, uh, a parent C Corp that is more exposed to the spot uh, market that's very exciting, as you're describing, and then RMLP, which has uh, 13 ships, 12 of which are on term charters. And so I think we'll continue to have that uh, greater, greater uh, desire for term business at the MLP and provide that visibility of cash flow for... Uh, a, a more dividend-oriented story, and then uh, certainly be patient and, and share uh, each of my three fellow panelists' views on on how strong the market should be over the next few years. So I think you would. I think our parent company will stay uh, more exposed to the spot market, and the MLP will continue with a a largely contracted strategy. And uh, I understand you have uh, eight ships, and your main shareholder has an additional five, uh, and your pretty exposed to spot. Uh, yeah, we have 13 vessels as well, but we haven't fixed any of them because we think the market will be great. So, uh, you know, why do medium term rates when you can do high rates? So that's basically our play. And of course, there's another big factor here, and that's the fact that there's been a huge technological shift on the vessels themselves. You know, 10 years ago, you still were running on steamships. Then 10 years ago, motor ships came along and you cut your consumption 50 tons. You increased the parcel size by maybe 20%. And then two years ago, you had the first uh, real kind of LNG vessels, slow speed two stroke engine, fuel fuel engine where you can run on gas and, and liquid fuel. Your parcel size is 30% bigger than a steam vessel and the fuel consumption is 50% less. So those are the vessels for the future. And you know, LNG has been this kind of uh, lagger in terms of technology, you know, nobody else was running on steamship. They, they, they went away from that technology a long time ago. Uh, and, and now actually you are on the leader in terms of technology because you are running on slow speed two stroke engines which are very efficient and then they are dual fuel so they can run on LNG. So this kind of scrubber issues, we, it, it's not an issue for us because we're running on, 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 on LNG. And if you are, have a big container vessel today or a tanker vessel, you are looking into getting the same kind of uh, engines as we have on our vessels. Uh, and 10 years ago, this, this industry was running on steam. So, and half of the fleet, more or less, are still steam. So it's going to be a big, you know, a big issue for the people with the steam vessels to recontract those vessels because people will be looking for the more efficient vessels with the bigger parcel size and, and less fuel consumption. And those are the vessels we have. We only have those kind of vessels. All our vessels built 2018 and then deliveries 1920s. Uh, and we have positioned ourselves for, for a better rate environment. But to, but to challenge you a bit, this chart shows that by 2020, most uh, ships' uh, delivery will be mega ships. Uh, and, but in 2015, most ship deliveries were trial fuel. So what's the, and you know, you have, and if you go another eight years back, uh, most were steam. So what's the, what's the risk of, of a new technology on ships that makes your yeah, It's uh, never ships, been lower. Uh, it's never been lower because now you are the leader, you've been the lagger. So, yeah, maybe you can do some better uh, hydrodynamics. You can cut your fuel consumption like 2% on, on you know, structuring the, the vessel a bit different. But it's not like it's going to be a revolution because it's already happened. So, so now, it's, uh, now it's done? No, of course, there's going to be gradual improvement. But it's not going to be this shift from steam to motor to slow speed uh, motor vessel with dual fuel. Yeah. I think it's important to point out that Eustand uh, ships are are uh, highly efficient for the long-haul uh, trade, where 
where, where you get uh, paid for uh, your low consumption on full speed. And you also, of course, have the benefit of size, being a larger size vessel than, than ours at least. But if you go down to a regular trade, which uh, unfortunately never actually happens in 19 and a half knots, where you have the benefit, or maybe I should say fortunately for our sake, the benefit isn't really that big. Uh, it's still there, and, and of course size is still uh, an issue uh, for those trades that require the bigger ships. I think, uh, and uh, as you mentioned before, the the older, I mean, there, there's actually a large part of the LNG fleet which is uh, what, what I like to call commercially challenged. And it's not just from a, a point of view of a, um, uh, a, a steamship which is, uh, which is less efficient, but it's also size. And size is not just a matter of uh, earnings It's uh, in LNG. Size is actually a matter of, of fitting into the systems where you have, uh, I mean, uh, in the old days, the, the uh, ships were standardized at 125,000 cubic meters up until early 2000s. Those ships are still running around, some of them. And, uh, but today, they, there are very, very few trades where they can actually fit. Uh, and even now, you, you, if you look at uh, the 138, I think that's probably the, the smallest ship you can actually trade uh, today, and, and you have to give a big discount. Uh, so there's a, there's a bunch of ships, there's actually almost 20% of the existing fleet, which is uh, small and inefficient. Uh, that will definitely struggle, but of course uh, might be saved by uh, the market going forward over the next few years. By, by 2020, we calculated about 10% of steamships uh, will come off long-term contracts. So what would, what would happen to these ships? I assume the, the debt levels have been paid down, so their cash break-evens are relatively low. Uh, charters don't really care about debt levels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no. They care if it fits no, into I, the logistic network. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for the reasons we've discussed earlier, our supply and demand view is that we we need you know every ship we have in the market and then some by 2022. We our, our gas log view is that we're at least 30 ships short in 2022, and so um, Cheryl Stein's view that we've reached a, a maybe technological equilibrium on how much more efficient the ships can be. Uh, but for this very visible period, when you know the supply perfectly of how many ships are going to be added to the market, we're going to need every one of those ships, and in our view, then some. Uh, which supports higher rates and every every type of propulsion system that you that you look at. 30 ships by 2022. That's only 15 and 21 and 22. Mm. Uh, that's not much. This year we have 50 ships delivered, maybe a bit more than that as well. So yeah, inclusive of that. Yeah. Well, I see. Jon said, you know, all the first generation steam vessels they are goners. You know, all the vessels left le lower than 138,000 cubic, they they are out of the business. And then the 138 to 155, they will still be around. Nobody will contract them for a long period of time. That's just using too much uh, too much fuel. But you know, they can do short haul spot market. Can probably do some term business, but not very long term business. And then. The term business will be for uh, the modern type. So, what's the, what's the premium rate you think you can achieve having a, a mega ship today? You should ask the the, the customer here, Don. Uh. <laughs> I'm building scale. Once I know exactly how many ships I need, I'll go and negotiate <laughs> with our friends here. <laughs> Okay. Um, you, 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 sometimes you have a look and you, know, you see these graphs, and you know sometimes you assume that okay, because basically the LNG is a live cargo. It's uh, almost like having livestock on board. It's you have this methane slip. You, know, you have to burn that methane, uh, and uh, you know when you people are putting this into the calculation model, they typically assume. No, LNG costing five dollars, and then they're using this as the yardstick for calculating the fuel efficiency difference. Problem is, you can sell that LNG at discharge port at twelve dollars. So w once you have an efficient vessel, you have a more cargo to sell. If you have an inefficient vessel, there's less cargo to sell, and that price of that cargo today is twelve dollars, not five dollars, which a lot of people are putting into their models, which is the the price at load port. But you know, when uh, when load port is uh, five six dollars in the US, U.S. and the price in the Far East is double, it's actually much more efficient. Okay. Uh, if you look at at the the chart to the left here, this shows our forecast of additional liquefaction volumes coming to the market. Uh, so by 2019, we forecast an additional 45 uh, million tons, and in 2020, 25 million tons. And we see in black how the U.S. will increase its market share uh, year by year. Uh, there's been delays to liquefaction plants historically. Uh, 
uh, now with a higher uh, gas price, uh, do we have the same risk of, of delays? How would, and also how would Australia differ from, from the US in the years to come? Um, look, I mean, the risk of delays is inherent about to the way that you're building the liquefaction plants. I would say that um, I'm privileged to be part of the uh, team at Tellurian with a number of people coming from Chenier and uh, the experience of building on time on budget. Uh, but it's really um, a teamwork between our approach of uh, building liquefaction and uh, working with Bechtel as an EPC contractor. Um, so I think that can be done on the Gulf Coast. Um, I think uh, Sharif uh, Suki, if he was here, would say that uh, I'm not sure that you can reproduce that all around the world. Um, some projects have been incredibly effective, like uh, Novatec in Arctic LNG and YAML, so, or at least YAML. Um, so it's possible. Um, I would say that we tend to agree with your numbers. Um, uh, it, we have about 100 million tons over uh, the next three years. Uh, so maybe scheduling is a bit different, but that relates to the uh, some time delays on, on building those, uh, those uh, liquefaction plants. Um, I think at the end of the day, what's, uh, at the end of that period, the question is what else is coming online? Uh, that, that's really what uh, should drive a number of the consideration for uh, people in the audience today, which is, okay, you've got these plants um, that have been sanctioned, that are being built, uh, but which one, which one are the other projects can, that are going to get built and require chartering of a significant number of uh, ships? Uh, Driftwood, our project is probably, it's 27.6 million tons, so, I would guesstimate that it's somewhere around 45 ships or so uh, to manage all that volume by 2025. Um, but you still have a situation where uh, you have a number of projects being built, then there's some kind of a, um, there's been a lack of FID of new projects, and then uh, the world is continuing to grow and absorbing these volumes, so we need more FID, there's gonna be a lot more LNG being consumed, and frankly, that means that we will need a lot more ships being built uh, to satisfy the needs of the customers. So I think it's a high growth area. There's a lot of uh, demand that is coming from that sector. Uh, we had, haven't really touched on IMO 2020, but each time I look at uh, forecast in, on our side of the industry and the supply side, barely, I would say, people include maybe 10 or 20 million tons of capacity for that. But the potential is much more significant and talking to you, uh, there seems to be a lot more uh, reality and uh, more needs behind that. So there's a discrepancy there and probably some trades around that. How important is, uh, from a shipping perspective, to have uh, the second wave of US liquefaction to be able in 2019 and 2020 to fix for a long duration? Uh, or, or is that just uh, added, added surplus and, and positive, but not necessary? I think we're more concerned about the second wave, where it's coming from, it's not that important. So you see right here. <laughs> Canada or if it's coming from Mozambique or Tanzania or Russia, you know. Yeah. I would say we, we, we share Antoine's view that US LNG is gonna be competitive all over the world um, and we'd love to see more US LNG built, but I uh, would agree it's, it's where liquefaction around the world and you know, even LNG Canada should have longer voyage distances than the average today, regardless if it's the northern or southern route that the ships end up taking. So, um, you know, more, more liquefaction is, is for, for us necessary and, and will be built and hopefully on timelines like yours that are very, you know, well managed. Okay, so how to sum up, uh, supply of ships will go down and demand will go up and, <laughs> and rates are already at uh, approaching $150,000 a day. So, so thanks for today and I look forward to the next few years. <laughs> so do we. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you.